Amen, amen. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, I have, uh, we have our moms here. Yeah. My mom, B. Horton, is over there. And Juanita Velez is right here in the, right here in the front seat. Uh, what's that? I was just thinking you kind of added a little, like, Spanish on that for a sink of the Mile weekend. I heard it. Velez. <laughs> uh, mamas. Our mamas in the room. Uh, my name is uh, Pastor Jameson. And uh, so thankful to be honored to be speaking yeah. with Good my morning. wife this morning, Raquel. Mm-hmm. Happy Mother's Day. Thanks, babe. Yeah, all right. <laughs> she was excited for that one. Oh, <laughs> uh, our prayer this morning is, uh, is that you just hear the word of God this morning, that your hearts will be so uh, more affectionate toward our King, um, that these words uh, that not we're speaking, but the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. shares, that your hearts will be open to receive what he has for you this morning, for men and women and children here this morning. Um, Because it's our prayer uh, every time we gather uh, that we will move closer to loving Jesus more and more and more. Um, So we're honored to be able to speak to you this morning. Um, So if you have your Bibles, would you jump with us to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verses 40 uh, through 48. Yep. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. The ma- then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet. He was pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. This is God's word. This morning, we want to share with you on the subject, Jesus is worth reaching for. Jesus is worth reaching for. Um, And I'll open and share uh, this time last year on Mother's Day. Jameson and I were actually not here at church with you all, um, which was not our initial plan. We found ourselves pivoting last minute. Um, because I was in a place of desperation. Uh, A couple months prior to that, to give you a little background, we were searching for a new home, and we had been praying for our new home that we were going to be buying. And anyone that's been a home buyer for the last few years, you know that spring market or any market requires a lot of prayer. So we'd been praying to God, and we were like, okay, Lord, you know the perfect house, and we're just praying for your blessing and your favor, and just you'll line everything up. And he did. He did. We were very blessed, and we felt very, very thankful. Um, he gave us a beautiful home, and he, the terms of the contract were even better than we could have hoped for, so we were feeling very, very thankful. And then we found out we were also going to receive another blessing. Uh, we found out that we were expecting a baby. We were pregnant, y'all. <laughs> and, and I was 45 years old at the time, which I know, I know that's not unheard of. That's not, you know, women have babies well into their 40s and late 40s, even some 50s. But it was not something that was in our plan. And so we found ourselves a little bit in shock. Um, my oldest son is sitting right here in the second row. So he's, he's 28. So we were like, what? So... The shock kind of wore off, and uh, me being a natural planner that I am, just went into plan mode. I was like, okay, so how's this going to affect our lives and our world, and how are we going to transition with this? And we started planning how we were going to share the news with our family and with our friends and with our our loved ones and how we were going to tell our youngest daughter, Maya, who'd been longing to be a big sister, that she was going to be a big sister. Um, We made all those plans in just a few short weeks, uh, but then we miscarried, and I had been through miscarriage before, so I told myself at that time, at that moment, I said, okay, you know what to expect, you know how this is going to go, and you will be okay. But this time, I was not. I fell very deeply into a place 
of both desperation and sorrow. And it was almost unbearable for me. Um, so today, I don't know what your story is, but I do know that Jesus wants to meet you in the most desperate places of your story. Um, it is Mother's Day, and that is a celebration. Motherhood is a beautiful thing. It's a gift. It's an incredible journey, so that's something worth celebrating. Um, but for some, it's a reminder of a heartbreak. It's a reminder of loss, and it's a reminder of dreams unmet. Maybe your story's not like mine, but I do know that someone listening today right here in the room or watching online with us, you've been longing for a child, and it hasn't happened yet. Or maybe you have experienced the loss of a child. Or possibly you have children that are older and they're facing challenges and that has left you feeling helpless. Maybe you have a child with a health condition that has just left you feeling exhausted both physically, mentally, emotionally, maybe even financially. Or maybe it's simply the loss of your own mother. Today we want you to know that Jesus meets you in the deepest needs of your story and that he is worth reaching for. Uh, the first point out of this story we see of why reaching for Jesus matters is uh, reaching for Jesus requires for you to release your rulership for Christ's rulership. Uh, this morning we see a story in Luke. Uh, we see a man named uh, Jairus who's getting ready to meet Jesus, and we see a story that intersects. It's a long story, but it's a story of two stories that are put together. Uh, we see in the beginning Jesus has crossed over the water. He's returning to Galilee. He's just getting off the boat, and there's a crowd waiting for Jesus. Uh, it says that they were waiting so much that when he got off the boat, they were pressing him. They were, they were getting ready to crush him. They were so excited to welcome Jesus. Uh, people from all walks of life in the crowd, uh, men, women, boys and girls, families, children, single people, all with a unique story and waiting to meet Jesus. And as the crowd is around Jesus, the scripture says there's a man named Jairus who comes in and presses his way to meet Jesus. This is why I love this story because it's not just about a woman, it's about a man. It's about a man who has some issues and a problem, and we see how Jesus uh, answers his need. It says that he is a synagogue leader. He, he's a synagogue ruler, which means he has uh, power, he has status, he has wealth, and the people know it. Uh, and with the power and with his status, the crowd probably moves away so he can actually enter to meet Jesus. Not only is, does he have status, not only does he have power, not only does he have influence, but he is a husband and he is a father. And it says that his 12-year-old daughter is dying. His 12-year-old daughter is dying and he is in a state of desperation. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a girl dad. I love being a girl. Any girl dads in the room? Yeah. Three. Three girl dads. All right. Uh, three girl dads. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm a girl dad, and uh, I have a beautiful girl named Maya. Uh, she's the only one. She's nine years old. You guys saw her picture up there. Uh, she's living with us. Uh, she's the only one in our home out of our four children. Um, she's absolutely amazing. She's full of joy. She's full of life. Um, in fact, you know, she has older brothers and sisters. You would think she is the only child. Uh, she lets you know she, she, she has daddy wrapped around her finger. She whispers, hey, daddy, can I get this? I was like, go ask your mama. No, I, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say yes. And uh, I say yes. You're right. Uh, she's amazing. Uh, absolutely beautiful. And uh, but when she gets sick, uh, she'll, she'll come into our room. She'll flop on our bed. And, and we know she's not feeling well because she's not joyous. She, she's, she's waiting for, for someone to, to help her out. Um, and so we'll make her some ramen noodles. Shout out to the ramen noodle folks in the building. Uh, we're some ramen noodles, give her some medicine, and, and send her to bed, tuck her in, and hopefully and prayerfully that she, uh, she recovers. Now, if she gets sick for a little bit, uh, a while longer, uh, we know that we have to take her to the doctor, and our prayer is when we take her to the doctor that the doctor will be able to tell us what is wrong, what's going on with her, and be able to fix or to help us fix and heal our mm -hmm. daughter. Right. Um, but if the doctor comes back out, we've never had this report, but if the doctor would come back out and the doctor would say, hey, hey, Jameson, hey, Raquel, uh, we don't know what she's going through. We can't figure it mm -hmm. out. Um, uh, she is about to die. 
and we cannot heal her. I, I don't know if there's a parent in the room who would not feel a sense of desperation in that moment. I don't know a parent in the room who would not be willing to do whatever it took to heal your child. And that's where Jairus is in this moment. He's in a place, in a state of desperation, and he can't do anything about it. His power can't fix it. His, his limited resources can fix it. His limited status can fix and heal his daughter. And he's willing to do anything to heal his daughter. I know about you, but, but I'll be willing to do anything to heal my daughter. In fact, I'll be willing to go to prison and do prison ministry if it took me healing my daughter by any means necessary. And this is the state that Jairus is in, a state of desperation. And in this moment, it says that he is persistent. He, he's pushing up against the crowd. And he says he's talking to Jesus. And he says, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you to help me. And he bows his life and bows his knees at the feet of Jesus. Why is this significant that he would bow himself to Jesus? It's significant because he is a public figure. And at this moment, he is bowing himself and his rulership to Jesus. He's making a public statement in front of everyone that I am, uh, I am limited in my power and I surrender my authority to you. It's a humbling position. It's a reverent position. Jairus, though he's a ruler, falls at Jesus' feet, owning that Jesus is the ruler above all. I love what Matthew's commentary says. He says, strong faith shall be applauded, yet weak faith shall not be rejected. Strong faith will be applauded. We love strong faith, strong faith. But in this moment, he has weak faith, and Jesus does not reject him in this moment. And I wonder how many of us here this morning are maybe like Jairus and think that our power can fix things that our own influence can fix things. Mm -hmm. My own status can fix things. Mm -hmm. uh, my, 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 my finances, my resources, uh, that surely can fix my situation of what I am going through. But Jesus is asking this morning, would you submit your life to him? Would you give up rulership of your own life and fall on your knees and make him the ruler of your life? And the first step to bowing to Jesus is knowing that he is rule. He is ruler. He is king. And even Jesus understood submitting. Jesus understood in his most vulnerable moment, he's getting ready to go to the cross. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says to the Father, not my will, but your will be done. I, I know I'm going to be suffering a, a, in, a, in the most severe thing in my life, but I'm willing to surrender my will for your will. Father, your will be done in my life. In fact, Philippians says this, if you're not willing to, to bow your knees, it says in Philippians 2, 9 and 10, Therefore God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And that name is Jesus Christ. And every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the heaven. And every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. At some moment in your life, every knee will bow and proclaim that Jesus Jesus is ruler above all of my question is, are you willing now to surrender your rulership for his rulership? Yeah. Are you willing to say that Jesus Christ is Lord? His two questions out of this. Will you live according to the world's definition of power or will you humbly surrender to Jesus' rulership and his power? This is a significant moment in the story where Luke is revealing the authority and rulership of Jesus Christ. What a powerful moment mm. being revealed. That's good, Jameson. Second point is reaching for Jesus positions you to see Jesus as your healer. Mm. Here's where their story interjects. As Jesus, Jairus, and the disciples are headed to Jairus' home, it says, while he was going, the crowds nearly crushing him, a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years who had spent all she had on doctors yet could not be healed by any, approached from behind and touched the tassel of his robe, and instantly her bleeding stopped. Each of the synoptic gospels tells the story of Jesus healing this woman. What we know about her is that she's deemed unclean, 
which meant that she's excluded from worship, excluded from community. She's supposed to live at home in isolation. Uh, she doesn't have a family. She's single. Uh, she could not be in public. And she was exhausted. She'd exhausted all of her resources trying to get help. And like Jairus, none of her resources could fix the condition that she had. She had no control over. She had become exhausted. Jameson, I don't know about men, but I do know for women that we often find ourselves in a constant state of exhaustion. We are exhausted trying to be the best at our parenting. We're exhausted trying to have a thriving marriage. We're exhausted caring for our loved ones. We're exhausted in our job trying to kill it at work. We're exhausted mentally fighting who we are. We're exhausted trying to cope with our emotions, comparing our lives to others, physically always trying to do more. We are exhausted trying to prove to others that we have it all together when most times they may not even care or even notice. I don't know if there's any women in the room today, but if you, if you identify with any of those feelings, put your hand up. We are exhausted. <laughs> We're exhausted. I think it's important to note, even in her exhausted state, she had a determination. Her faith gave her a confidence and a knowing that if she could just find a way to get to Jesus, then touch the edge of his robe, she would be healed. That makes me think of that old commercial gimmick you've probably all heard that a little dab will do. She, she knew that just a little touch would be enough to heal her. Um, she wasn't of status, so she could not approach Jesus the way Jairus did. Um, she would have to be strategic. She would have to be intentional. She would have to get close enough and yet be discreet at the same time. I believe as women, God gives us this wisdom. A determination, if you will, of how to, in our most desperate times, to reach for him. Four items to note about this woman that speak to her strengths. The first item is she broke out of isolation to seek out and reach for Jesus. She was not supposed to be in public, but living in isolation, as we read, when you're in a desperate way, isolation is the last place you want to be. We are relational. We need community. We have to do life together. And this woman, recognizing that she could not stay in isolation any longer, came out into the public to reach for Jesus. Secondly was the obstacle of the large crowd, which was pressing forcefully upon Jesus. Uh, just yesterday, Jameson and I, we were at Cinco de Mayo on 24th Street, and y'all, it was incredible. There was hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people crowding the streets, all heading the same direction towards the incredible music, the delicious smelling food, the festivities, the carnivals. It was a scene that took me to this moment, knowing we'd be sharing this morning on the story. And I looked at the crowd at that moment, and I thought, Getting to Jesus would have been next to near impossible in a situation like this for anyone, much less this woman. Um, I mean, for Jairus, he's a ruler, so we read they, they probably parted and made a path for him. But for a woman of this lesser status, they would not have, they would not have done that. Um, so nevertheless, it was the most incredible task for this woman to get through the crowd. Thirdly, she was in a weakened condition. It tells us that she had been bleeding for 12 years. I can't imagine that she had the same physical fitness of a woman that maybe works out every day or is very athletic. She had to get through this crowd in a weakened condition. Uh, it might have been a major undertaking even that morning just for her to get out of bed, let alone accomplish that task. And finally, the woman had to reach Jesus by working her way through the crowd and yet do it so it didn't draw attention to herself. It is not hard to see why this woman may have wanted it that way. Uh, society had told her that she was unworthy. Uh, she was unclean. She had a female problem. She uh, did not want to pro probably proclaim that in front of the large crowd, what her situation was. So there she went, being intentional and yet discreet at the same time. We might think she wanted it that way, as I mentioned, because she felt unworthy. And I'm wondering if the world has ever told you that you were unworthy. We know her world certainly told her so. 
If so, listen to what happens next. She touches the edge of Jesus' robe, and instantly she's healed. Her hemorrhaging stops. But so does Jesus. He, the scripture reads, he stops and he turns and he says, Who touched me? Peter, his disciple at his side, possibly perturbed, says, Master, there's people all around you. They're pressing in from all sides. Um, and Jesus doesn't move. He stops and he, he insists, Someone touched me. The power has gone out from me. When the woman realizes that she has been found out, she comes and throws herself at Jesus' feet, and she tells him why she had done what she did and how she'd been instantly healed. And his response to her is not one of contempt for her stealing a healing, but in return he says these brief... You gotta say that different. You gotta say that. Where's my wife? You gotta say that again. His response to her is not one of contempt for stealing yeah. a healing. <laughs> Hi, that's what she did. Um, but in return, our gracious, gracious Savior says to her these brief but powerful words. He says to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Yeah. Jesus speaks to who she is. Up until now, she didn't even have a name in the story. But he calls her by the highest name he could have given her, which is daughter. Amen. Then he speaks to her faith. And he says her, about her reliance on him. He speaks to her situation. Healed means saved. He knew it was not just a physical need. He blesses her. Go in peace. Shalom, which is a Hebrew word with a very rich meaning. Uh, shalom meaning completeness, wholeness, health, peace, prosperity, perfectness, fullness, rest, harmony, and the absence of agitation and discord. It is to be complete, perfect, and full. We have to see Jesus as our healer. And healing is not just physical. Jesus wants to heal whatever it is that you bring to him. Whatever you are desperately desiring for him to do so you can be fully complete and fully whole. The wounds of your hearts, the traumas of your past, the disappointments, your deepest disappointments and sorrows. Earlier I shared about last Mother's Day and my own desperation. There was so much love and so much care that was shown to me during that time. Everything from gifts and cards and flowers and meals brought to the home and songs written and it blessed me immeasurably. But nevertheless, two months later, I found myself in what felt to be this deep, deep pit of despair and sorrow and I could not pull myself out. It was at that time that I never felt closer to Jesus. I knew he was with me. And that he took my deepest pain and my deepest sorrow when I reached for him. And he healed it. And I know that it's with confidence that I can stand right here today and share with you of his goodness and his faithfulness. In my desperate time, he, I never was closer to him. Uh, he took that sorrow and that pain I bore. He replaced it with the promise that one day in heaven we would see that precious baby and hug that baby. Um, he mended my brokenness, and he was my healer. Jesus is our healer. Amen. Amen. Lastly, uh, reaching for Jesus uh, reveals Christ as our restorer. Mm. Uh, we see the story move from uh, this moment uh, where uh, this woman is being healed. Um, at the same time, <clears throat> Jairus is hearing this. And he sees Jesus uh, healing this woman. And, and Jesus is saying these things. He says, be healed and go in peace. Um, but at the same time, uh, someone from Jairus' home comes and meets him. And as Jesus is saying these words, the person says, uh, don't waste your time. Your daughter is dead. Don't waste your time. Your daughter is dead. Um, but they didn't see or witness what Jesus had just did. They, they don't know what Jesus could possibly do. They just start whispering um, uh, this, this moment of, of unbelief mm -hmm. to Jairus. And in this moment, Jairus could have left. He could have, he could have, he could have ran. Um, but I don't know what Jairus, uh, what he was feeling in this moment as, as someone and as a parent. And someone comes to you and says, uh, your daughter was, was dying, but now she is dead. Uh, in that moment, uh, I probably would have been angry. 
In that moment, I would have been frustrated. In that moment, I would have been like, uh, Jesus, uh, you could have healed my daughter, uh, but you wasted your time with her. Probably my thoughts, not reality. Because my, my situation is, is in much desperate need. My, my daughter is dying. And in that moment, he could have ran and left. And he could have said, I don't trust Jesus. I don't know what he wants to do. Um, and oftentimes we receive these moments where we see what Jesus has just done in our lives, mm-hmm. but we hear the lies of the enemy, right? Yeah. Don't waste your time with Jesus. Mm-hmm. Why, why keep coming to church? Don't, don't waste your time mm-hmm. with Jesus. Uh, even though you've just seen what he has done, uh, we can get and, and fall into the trap of hearing lies in the moment, of believing that Jesus doesn't care about our situation. I love this. Jesus hears and responds immediately. He says, don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. Don't be afraid. Just believe she will be healed. Uh, This can seem sometimes problematic in the church because oftentimes we just say, just believe. Just believe. Just, just, Just believe. Trust Jesus and just believe as if there's no emotions tied to what we are facing. But I love what Rich Valadis, he says this, God reminds us a hundred times in the Bible, do not fear. For God is not telling us not to feel. To feel is, a, is not a sign of spiritual weakness. But God is saying, turn your gaze toward him, for you are not alone. Even though you feel you are not alone, turn your gaze toward him. And as they enter into the home, uh, people are weeping, they're wailing, they're mourning. Mm-hmm. And Jesus says, stop wailing. I know you think she is dead, but she is only sleeping. Mm-hmm. And he grabs her by the hand and he speaks life to her. He says, my child, get up. And it says, immediately her spirit comes back mm-hmm. and she is revived. And in this moment, and what we are seeing in scripture, what Luke is writing to us is we're seeing Christ as the restorer. Mm-hmm. We've seen him as as ruler we've seen him as healer and now we see it unveiling as christ as our restore i love this first peter says this as he's talking to us he says in first peter 5a be alert and sober mind your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour the enemy prowls around whispering lies to you telling you don't follow jesus why waste your time it's not worth it he doesn't care he doesn't know your story the enemy prowls around trying to devour those who are not willing to lean into what Christ has done. But in verse 9, it says this, resist him, resist the enemy, resist the lies, stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers through the world, throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. The God of all grace, when you're going through trauma, when you're going through past hurts, when you're going through situations, when you don't understand, it says, stand firm, stand strong, for God will restore you and make you strong. That is the good news of the gospel. That is what Christ has done. We are being, he is being revealed as Christ, the restorer. No matter how tough things are, are going to matter how bad you are feeling, no matter what situation you are in, Christ will restore you and make you strong and make you firm and steadfast. That is good news. Question is, is Jesus the object of your faith? Is he Lord over your life? Do you believe that he is healer? Do you believe that he can restore all things. Uh, Believing is not as much as faith as believing as who is the object of your faith. It's saying that Jesus can do what nothing and no one else can. And I wonder this morning if you're here, if you believe these words, maybe you've been searching, trying to spend your resources and your time and your energy and your power, and your influence, and your status, trying to fix a situation that only Jesus can heal. Trying to fix a marriage that only Jesus can restore. 
I wonder if you would lean in to Christ as restore, as Christ as healer. Would you submit your life to him as Christ as ruler and say, God, it's not in my power that I can do this, but it's only through the power of Jesus Christ. For Luke is revealing this to us. He's saying in this moment, as he's pinning to us, to, to us as readers, would you believe and see what Christ has done, not just for them, but what he wants to do for you this morning? For he is worthy of all glory and adoration. For, for he is worthy of, of surrendering all that you have. And I don't know if you can testify in here, but I know surrendering my life to Jesus has been the best thing that I have ever done. He's restored relationships. He's restored friendships. He's, he's healed our broken heart. He's been there in moments where we didn't understand. When we couldn't fix the situation on our own, when we even with power and influence and resources, still cannot fix the brokenness of what we are experiencing. And we experience healing only by the power of Jesus. By praying, by reaching out and saying, Christ, I need you. Christ, I surrender. It's hard. The enemy saying, it's not worth it. Why keep following? It's not, it's not worth it. Why, why show up and try to put a smile on my face when we're going through pain in our lives? I had to preach knowing my wife is in pain. I had to smile knowing my wife is at home struggling. I had to preach the gospel, just have hope. When I'm trying to hang on to hope myself, and it was only Christ who could have been there for us. And I'm so thankful for a community. I'm so thankful for a church to be able to sit with, to be able to pray with. I'm thankful for friendships, like Pastor Tyler going to his office and crying like, yo, this is what we're facing. Yeah. That's what the body is for. That's what this community is for. That's what the power does of Christ when we come together in community and that everything's not always going good and praise God when things are going good and we can joy, rejoice when those who are rejoicing and mourn with those who are mourning. And that's what we see here in the gospel. And I wonder what hard moment, I wonder what challenges you are facing. Would you reach for Jesus this morning? Maybe you need Jesus to be ruler this morning. He's available. Maybe you need Jesus healing this morning. He is available for you. Maybe you need restoration this morning. He is a provider for you, for the good news is that Jesus has already done this through the cross and the resurrection. The question is, will you believe? Will you believe? Would you bow your heads with us? Bow your heads with us. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for revealing to us this morning your power and your greatness. Lord, thank you through your word you've revealed your rulership, your authority. That you came to earth with all power and authority to heal the brokenhearted, to mend the wounded, to redeem those who were lost. God, thank you for your healing power this morning to heal the brokenhearted, to heal the wounded. Thank you for your restoring power to redeem those who were lost, to restore those who have been walking in challenges, trying to fix things on their own. God, I pray this morning, I pray this morning that those who have not bowed their knee to you will bow their knee and their hearts to you and make you the ruler of their lives. And I pray this morning for, for mothers who are experiencing heartache and challenges. God, I pray that you will restore their joy, restore their peace, restore their love, would you reignite their passion and desire for you? We push back the lies of the enemy that says Jesus isn't worth it. We push back the lies of the enemy that says Jesus doesn't care about your story. We push back the lies of the enemy that says just give up and quit. And we speak the truth that Jesus is for you. Jesus stops just for you and your story. And he's inviting you to say, will you believe in who I am? God, may we be a church that believes this. May we be a church that walks with people, talk with people, and 
encourages one another that we will rejoice in seasons of rejoicing and weep in the seasons of weeping and be a people that lift our hands and give you glory no matter what the situation is. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.